the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated stations present The Pacific Story. In the mounting fury of world conflict, events in the Pacific are taking on ever greater importance. Here is the story of the Pacific and the millions of people who live around this greatest sea. The drama of the peoples whose destiny is at stake in the Pacific War. Here, as another public service, is the tale of the war in the Pacific and its meaning to us and to the generations to come. Yunnan, anchor of the Burma Road. I stood on Ching Pai Lu, the main street of Kunming, that I was seeing the last of the old Yunnan. The cobbled streets teemed with activity. Rickshaw men darted between the mules and ponies of the caravan. Chickens and pigs and dogs scurried out of the way. Bullets dragged rumbling carts. The air was heavy with dust and insinuating smells. I walked down toward the great gate. This day was a little different from any other day in Kunming. Traffic like this had been going on here for ages. Caravans had been coming and going. But then, as now, Kunming was a gateway to the little-known hill country. It hardly seemed possible that Kunming was a mile high, for towering above it were mountains, some of them 16,000 feet high. Magnificent, are they not? Oh, Dr. Wu. I never tire of looking up at those mountains. They are so forbidding and austere. They look almost impassable. They are, Mr. Conover. Men have cut trails through them and taken caravans through them for long years. But they have never really conquered them. No. It's always seemed to me that those caravan roads lead out to strange lands. That is right. Out there beyond is a different sort of a world... The different peoples. Yes, I've seen some of them. The ones that came down from the hills, down here to Kunming. There are many different peoples back there. Perhaps no one knows for sure how many different tribes there are in Yunnan. Well, are some of them really barbarians, as they say, Dr. Wu? Well, Yunnan was once called the land of the southern barbarians. But what is meant by barbarian? They are different from us. Yes, I've seen some of them here, too. Then you can judge. But there are others, too, aren't there? Oh, yes. There are the Shan and the Miao and the Lashan tribes and others that we know even less about. Well, do you know, Dr. Wu, there's always seemed to me to be something strange or inconsistent about this situation here. Yes. I mean that here, where there are so many wild tribes and where one people can hardly understand the other, even though they've lived as neighbors for centuries... That here in Kunming, there should be a center of culture. And there should be scholars here, such as you. I have been here all these years because of this situation, Mr. Conover. Well, I, I guessed that. Yet it seems that I have learned little. I have seen the caravans move through the city and out through the gateways into the mountains. And I have seen the caravans come back. And I saw the railroad built here from Indochina. And I have watched the opium traffic. But now, looking back, it seems that I have learned very little of what there is to know about Yunnan. You know more about Yunnan and Kunming, Dr. Wu, than anyone who... Oh, what is that disturbance, Mr. Conover? Oh, I don't know. There seems to be some excitement over there. Yes. Come on, let's see what it is. The Japanese struck last night in the dark. Hello, Chen. What's the matter? Oh, Mr. Conover, the Japanese have made an attack on us outside of Beiping. What? Fighting has broken out in North China around Beijing. What do you... Oh, you mean the Japanese? The Japanese have attacked us. And this morning they have already taken some of our strong places around Beijing. It's come, Mr. Conover. Yes. They say that the fighting it is... It would be a long war, Mr. Conover. And we may never live to see the end of it. The 
fighting was thousands of miles away, and yet we could feel every pulsating throb. Beiping has fallen to the Japanese, and they are now moving in force. Beautiful Langkai University at Tianjin has been destroyed by the Japanese, and they are now driving... Shanghai is being shelled by the Japanese, and they have now landed strong units who are striking... The Japanese are hitting with full force in the direction of the capital of Nanking, and are using... With the coming of the war, the old Kunming and the old Yunnan passed. For many years, this isolated province of the interior, directly above Burma, wedged in between French Indochina and Sikong, had been independent. Then it was subdued by the fabulous Kublai Khan. And for years after that, it was the center of bitter dispute. Warlords, dynamic and ruthless bandits, rose to power and fell. Yunnan is the most corrupt part of all China. God, your tongue. There is no mercy in those who rule us. They are not our rightful rulers, and they are corrupt. Your blood would be a high price to pay for your loose tongue. The strong ones fight for the taxes that are wrung out of our very lives and for the wealth they get from the opium traffic. And we get nothing but misery. Hold your tongue. That one dares with the leaders who rule us. Our lives do not belong to them, and Yunnan does not belong to them. Our hope is in waiting until we have help against these usurpers, and that time... Opium brought in more taxes and foodstuffs. As a result, many people of Yunnan starved. And more than that, suffered the consequences of opium. And Yunnan's connection with the central government was thin. The coming of the war changed this. The opium production had to make way for food production. For the people had to grow food or starve. And the coming of the war brought central government agencies into the province and drew it closer toward Chungking. We in Yunnan could feel the war approaching. By the first part of 1939, the Japanese had sealed off most of the ports of entry into China. The refugees moved inland. They poured into Yunnan. We have come all the way from Tianjin. You brought all those heavy cases all the way across China from Tianjin? There are books in them. It is all we have left of Nankai University. I remembered it. The Japanese had blasted Nankai University from the face of the earth. You were an instructor there? Yes. Many of our students helped us bring the books across the country. For weeks and months, the students straggled into Kunming. Others came from Tsinghua University and National at Beiping. Still others from Sun Yat-sen University at Canton. We are organizing the exile universities into a joint university here, Mr. Conover. It will be called Southwestern Associated University. You see, the will to learn and to progress cannot be crushed. Kunming doubled in population. More scholars came to mingle with the strange people from the hills. And government men came and military men. For now, supplies that could not be brought in through China's ports were coming in over the Hanoi Kunming Railway from Indochina and over the caravan trails. Kunming was becoming a great depot, a center of communications with the outside world. But the sky was darkening over Kunming. The Japanese have occupied Hanoi and Haiphong in French Indochina. Occupied? Let me see that dispatch. Yeah. Yes. This means that that the Japanese have control of the terminal port of the Hanoi Kunming Railway. It means that they will permit no more supplies to be brought into Hanoi over the railway into Yunnan. Yes. Yes. They are determined to blockade us. It is even more serious than that. You mean they will use the railroad against us? You can be sure of it. They will bring their supplies into Hanoi by ship and then move them up the railroad against us. Will we destroy the railroad, the portion in Yunnan? We cannot afford to destroy it. We will tear it up and move it inland. We will have use of it elsewhere. Yunnan was left without one railroad line to the outside world. Now the caravan trails that led out through the mountains became China's arteries, a very lifeline. Trucks straining under the loads made their torturous way over the Burma Road from Lashio up through Wanting and Lungling to Kunming. 
They brought in gasoline and airplane parts and a thousand other things needed to carry on a war. But still, we cannot get enough gasoline for our airplanes. No, I don't see how you can. We are training 600 Chinese pilots in the three schools in this vicinity. We must have gasoline. Do you have enough training planes? Not enough, no. But if we had the gasoline, we could keep them in the air throughout the hours of the day. And in this way, we could give instruction to many of our cadets. The gasoline had to be brought to Rangoon by ship, up to Lashio by railroad, and by trucks over the Burma Road to Kunming. We have plenty of willing hands. We have built that airplane factory over there. And that textile mill down there. But we cannot get enough supplies to run them. Japanese bombers coming! Air raid! Air raid! Throw yourself down, Mr. Conover! Lie down! Lie down! Here, come on, get down yourself! shelters then in Kunming. Those who were lucky escaped the flying fragments of the bombs and the bullets of the Japanese machine guns. But all were not lucky. The fields were littered with wrecked planes and spattered with blood. Now it was started. And we knew the Japanese bombers would be back again and again. <laughs> Under the shower of bombs, the trucks continued to roll over the twisting Burma Road. But the greatest blow was still to fall. Under pressure from Japan, the British government has agreed to close the Burma Road to the transit of war materials for a period of three months. With Britain blasted unmercifully from the sky by the Nazi blitzkrieg, the Churchill government entered into this temporary agreement. The rain drove down and despair settled upon Yunnan. What are we going to do? Some supplies are still being smuggled into us. Not one millionth of what we need. And the Japanese are concentrating on stamping out this source. Supplies were piling up in Burma. There was no way to get them across the mountains to Yunnan. I don't think they will ever open the Burma Road again. Britain has cut us off from supplies. And the United States goes on selling scrap iron and oil to Japan. Will no nation help us? When October came, Britain was still standing up to the Nazi Blitz. And in the first week of October, Britain reopened the road. Supplies began to roll into Yunnan once more. From Yunnan, they were dispatched to China's war fronts. But now, Kunming buzzed with rumors. I would say that the tension between the United States and Japan... If you ask me, there's going to be a showdown between Japan and America in the Pacific. The Japanese are going to try to close the Burma Road again. They're Japan going to and the United States, States are going to be at war in a matter of weeks. Maybe even days. In September 1941, Americans showed up in Kunming. You see, Conover, it's going to be a Lend-Lease deal. Yes. Now, this map will show you where the railroad's going to be. Going to hook on down that last year, eh? Yeah, yeah. You see... Here's Rangoon down here. Uh-huh. A section of the railroad from Rangoon up here to Lashio was completed, oh, uh, 40 years ago. Now, our plan is to start here at Lashio and extend the railroad right across here, up here to Kunming. Uh, about 400 miles, eh? Yeah, yeah. And when it's completed, it will link the Indian Ocean with Yunnan and Kunming. That's going to be an enormous job. Rugged country through there. Well, we'll probably have to use from a quarter of a million to half a million workers. And these workers will have to operate. The situation in the Pacific had become crucial. Word came that the Flying Tigers under Chinook had landed down at Rangoon and Tungu and were getting ready to come up here to Kunming. This is the tip-off. We're going to be at war with Japan any minute now. That's the way they talked here. And while we waited for the Flying Tigers, another message came. The Japanese have bombed Pearl Harbor. What did I tell you? What did I tell you? Twelve days later, Chinook's flying tigers winged down over the mountains into Kunming. And the next day, the Japanese attacked. Boy, that's 
what I call a score. Ten Japanese planes, and every one of them either knocked down or damaged by the Tigers. Wahoo! Gunming had become more important than ever before. Now we had pilots and planes to fight the Japanese bent on stopping the traffic over the Burma Road. But now also we knew that it would be only a matter of time until the Japanese would move in and take the Burma Road. French Indochina and Thailand are already in the hands of the enemy. And the Japanese are now invading Burma. The Burma Road is lost. Not only the Burma Road. Work has been stopped on the Yunnan Burma Railway. They have cut us off from the outside world. <laughs> But now China had allies. Now the United States and Britain and Russia were on her side. Yunnan was blockaded, hemmed in like a village in a stockade. The only way to bring in supplies now was by air, over the hump from India. This meant more air base facilities. New fields were built. Old fields expanded. New supply depots set up. Supplies came in, but not enough. But now, among the teeming hundreds of thousands in Kunming, a new word was heard. Lado. Lado. They're building a new road from India into China. Lado. I flew over the hump into India. Then I went up the railroad that ends at Lado. They were starting the road from there. It's a matter of shopping your way through every inch of the way. Talk to an engineer. Look at those men over there, hanking their way through. There were American soldiers, many of them Negroes, and Chinese and Indians. The bulldozers do the heavy work. The bulldozers plowed into the jungle, drove ahead, backed away, and drove ahead again. You've got to fight your way through it. Yes. You see those mountains up ahead of us there? Yes. Those are the Fat Koi Mountains. We've got to cross them. Well, I don't see how you're going to get over that terrain. Mountains, deep valleys, and all of it covered with jungle. The terrain isn't the worst of it. There's the weather and malaria. I know. It rains here five months out of the year. And when it rains, there's malaria everywhere. Well, what about the enemy? There are Chinese scouts ahead of us. But I've got an idea. It's not going to be long before we'll be hearing gunshots. Or even be closer than that. It wasn't long. The Japanese swallowed up all of Burma and attacked western Yunnan. I went back to Yunnan. It was an embattled citadel. They have taken Ten Chung and Lung Ling, here and here. Chinese general pointed to the map. We have had the Japanese to the east of us here in Indochina for nearly two years. And now, with them here, we are blockaded from the south. Well, this country here is where the Lido Road is coming through, isn't it? Yes, that is the region we must clear of the enemy. They have occupied this country here, west of the Salween River. Well, that means that they are between us here and western Yunnan, and the road crews working eastward from Lado. They are between us, yes. And our objective is to clear them out. It was a race for time. A bloody, ruthless, terrible race. Whereas the Japanese were hemming us in, in Yunnan, they were driving westward toward Ichang and toward Chungking, in an effort to knock China out of the war. China needed supplies, needed them pitifully. If the Japanese could be cleared out of northern Burma and western Yunnan, the road could be pushed through despite the heartbreaking terrain, the pouring rain and malaria. That mortar fire is coming from that ridge up there. Yes, and the machine gun fire is coming from just below it. And we cannot move up until we silence them. You have your orders. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Keep down. All right. Move up. That's the way it was. Every ridge was a fortified stronghold. The Chinese fought up the steep slopes of mountain ranges, eight and ten thousand feet high. They fought down through lush, water-sogged valleys, so tangled with jungles that they could hack their way through only a few yards a day. Meantime, General Stilwell's forces were fighting their way from Lado toward Michinar. All the time, Brigadier General Louis A. Pick was pushing the road through the jungles. Word just come in, sir, that a Japanese force is moving down toward us. Our enemy isn't the Japanese here. It's water. Yes, sir. Our advance patrols have probably already engaged the Japanese. 
Sergeant. We'll keep on working. Keep me informed. Yes, sir. All right. Bring up that bulldozer. When the road would be pushed through, we didn't know. Tanner's need for supplies grew. Day by day, the big transport planes came swooping down over the hump from India. The supplies they brought were absorbed as the sponge takes up water. With each passing day, Yunnan was becoming more important as the United Nations base. This is to be another new barracks, Mr. Canova. Well, how many are going to be built? As many as we need. This country is being transformed so rapidly, I can hardly realize. Yes, since the war here in Yunnan, we have opened new tin and copper mines. We have built a copper refinery, a copper wire plant, an electrical power plant, a chemical works... And an electrical equipment plant. Yes, and many others. Well, the old Yunnan is gone. Yes. And a new Yunnan is being born. The fighting went on in the jungles. In May 1944, the Chinese crossed the Salween River, rooted the Japanese out man by man. Stilwell's forces cleaned up Michinaw and drove on, and General Pick pushed the road through foot by foot. By New Year's 1945, we in Yunnan could see daylight. The Lado Road was completed. next to me on the street in Kunming. This is like the 4th of July. Listen to those firecrackers. The streets of Kunming were jammed. People looked down from the roofs. People crowded every window. Women and children, soldiers, coolies, Americans, Chinese, people of the hill tribes. Ah, gee, this is something. It's like Christmas Day back home, only more. Can you see the trucks coming? Ah, not yet. Oh, this is a great day, Mr. Conover. Huh? Oh, Dr. Ah. Wu. Yes, it is. It certainly is. I am as excited as the youngest child. Well, everyone is. This is the end of 30 months of blockade. 30 months. Hey, hey, there's the first one. It's a jeep. The first convoy of trucks over the Lado Road was coming into Kunming. I am so happy I could weep. Dr. Wu stood on his tiptoes and strained to see the coming truck. Hey, there it is. There's the first one. Look, it's a tall decked out in flag. <laughs> Who is that in that first truck, Mr. Conover? Well, let's see. Why, I think that's Brigadier General Pick. Yes, yes, it is. I've seen his picture. Hey, hey, look, Mr. Conover. There's General Pick in that first Jeep. Flags and bunning decked the trucks. And as they passed, their crews, as joyous as the people of Kunming, shouted greetings. King Ho! King Ho! King Ho! Right back at you! Nice going, guys! King Ho! King Ho! King Ho! King Ho! Ding Ho! Ding Ho! Even old Dr. Wu returned the greetings. As the trucks rumbled by, dozens and scores of them, Dr. Wu's face grew solemn. Each of these trucks was bringing in a cargo of supplies. This was just the first convoy. From now on, there would be an endless line of convoys. This road has been paid for in blood, Mr. Conover. Dr. Wu watched the passing trucks, not an expression on his face. Then he spoke again. Every foot of it was paid for in human life. They died, those thousands of Americans and Indians and Chinese and all the others so that we might gain strength to fight for our lives. The thousand-mile road to Kunming is dotted with the graves of the men, even the women and children who died fighting and working through the jungles. At one time, 80% of the workers on the road were ill. In the Baoshan stretch that was blown up by the Chinese when Burma was taken in 1942, this stretch was rebuilt almost entirely by women and children. I saw them working there. Children as young as 11 years old, women as old as 65. 
and many young mothers carrying babies on their backs. That's why they call that stretch the road of the women and children. Today, supplies are rolling into Kunming by the thousands of tons. Those are military supplies being unloaded there. Munitions? Yes. Military supplies have a priority over all other supplies. But we are also bringing in supplies for civilians, health equipment, and medicine. Well, what is your potential over the road as compared with the supplies that used to come in over the hump? Well, our potential, Mr. Conover, is several times the amount brought in over the hump. But we have several problems before we can achieve that. Lack of trucks? We need more trucks, of course. And we need spare parts and machines for our repair stations. But we also need to train truck drivers. Yes, I can see that. In your country, you have an almost unlimited number of men who can drive trucks. But we do not have that in China. Therefore, right now we are preparing to train 5,000 truck drivers. And when we have done this... I talked to a military man. We expect to bring in about 1,000 tons a day... That will be about enough to keep ten infantry divisions in combat for about seven days a month. 30,000 tons of supplies a month, plus what will be brought in by plane over the hump, ought to We give... cannot count on what will be brought in over the hump. The road will relieve the pressure on the air service, but for a long time the 14th Air Force has needed more than could be flown in. Now it will be possible to devote the entire capacity of the air service to General Chenault's Air Force. But that indirectly will help us, for it will give us more strength in the air over our operations on the ground. So you see, Mr. Connor... Your road was named the Stillwell Road. And to us here in Kunming, it became the highway to hope. And Kunming has become a symbol of fortitude and resistance. And more. From an isolated caravan city in the little-known interior of Yunnan... It has become one of the most vital military bases in Asia. Yeah, it's just a routine one day's flight from Kunming to Calcutta now. This is a young flyer in the air service over the hump. They tell me it used to take two months by caravan and boat to make the trip. <laughs> I can hardly believe it. And yet, lots of times while I'm flying over that rugged country, I think about the guys that put that road through. Over that road, rolling into Yunnan in the endless procession of trucks, are drivers who know well... How the road has changed, you know. As they roll over the twisting, turning highway, they drive through an arch at the 37th boundary stone of the Yunnan frontier. They stop and read the inscription on the arch. On one side, it says, To Tokyo. And on the other side, it says, We won. Listening to the Pacific Story, presented by the National Broadcasting Company and its affiliated independent stations, as a public service to clarify events in the Pacific and to make understandable the cross currents of life in the Pacific Basin. For a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. To repeat, for a reprint of this Pacific Story program, send 10 cents in stamps or coin to University of California Press, Berkeley, California. story is written and directed by Arnold Marquis. The original musical score was composed and conducted by Thomas Peluso. The principal voice was that of Jack Edwards, Sr. This program came to you from Hollywood. This is the National Broadcasting Company. <laughs>